Prior to Breanne's death, she was working. Actually, she had just started a new job. She had just returned from a trip down south with her mother. She was very active socially. Uh, she and I were extremely close. I saw her virtually every day and certainly spoke to her every day. And I did speak to her the day before she passed away, the, ver the very night before, as a matter of fact. I stopped by her this new job that she just thought started. The first night she was serving in a restaurant downtown Halifax. And I stopped by, and, and she was very busy hustling about, as she always did. She was very positive outgoing, extremely uh, energetic young lady. She was going from one table to another and talking to people and hustling with a great smile on her face. She didn't have time to chat with me, obviously. She just waved, smiled, and, and then later that night, she called me, as she always does, said that she had had the best night of serving that anybody had had on their first night on that particular job. Her boss had complimented her and said that she was a great job. She was very upbeat and positive and said she was going out to celebrate their, her upcoming birthday, which was in about four days. How so old was she going to be? She was going to be 21. A friend of hers um, was also exactly the same birthday. I'd invite her over to her apartment for uh, to celebrate, just the two of them. Brienne was very upbeat about that. So you're not going to be drinking? And, and she said, no. And I said, that's great, sweetie. I'm very proud of you and I love you. That's the last time I spoke to her. What happened? The following morning. I didn't, uh, couldn't reach her by text or call in her apartment, so I, around uh, noon I went over to her apartment. And when I walked into the apartment in Halifax, there was a police officer standing there, inexperienced, I'm sure, in this matter. And I asked her where my daughter was. She didn't answer me. She couldn't tell me. And I said, well, I have... I want to see her, and I have a key to her apartment. Can I get into her apartment? And she said, no, you have to wait here. For many attempts to ask her, why couldn't I go in there? I said, where's my daughter? She finally, very softly, said, she's at the morgue. At that moment, I started to weep uncontrollably, and I wept uncontrollably every day for well over six months. I continued on with my life, of course. I had those moments. As any father or mother could appreciate, losing a child, it has an incredible impact on you, one that you would not wish on your worst enemy. As I say, I still weep regularly. I'm a little bit more in control of it. Uh, I know the words that I, when I say the words, I know oh, they will lead me down the wrong path. I will break down, so I, I avoid that. I guess many people do. So what did you learn about the circumstances surrounding her death? The police couldn't shed a great deal of light on it, and they basically just said, we'll have to wait for the toxicology report, which is sent down to the state, comes back, and it takes six months, typically, and when it came in, the results were that she died of an overdose of a combination of alcohol and prescription drugs, or Valium and Dilaudid. I knew that Brianne drank and party too much, constant concern of mine. However, of her many, many friends, I would say that she was not un truly that unusual in that regard. With respect to the drugs. She had had a prescription for Valium, but I thought it was actually all used up because she and I were extremely close. I would take her to the drugstore to buy the whatever prescription she had. I would visit, I would take her to the doctor's appointments. We would talk about things. So we were extremely close. There were virtually no secrets between us. And I dare say that there are many times she probably told me things that she wouldn't share with her own mother because her mother, bless her soul, who loves her dearly, was a little more um, inquisitive, whereas I would just talk and listen and accept her for who she was. I never heard her talk about the lot, never knew her to have used it in the past. Many people think that the lot in combination with alcohol is lethal, and that's what I think people should know. Is this, uh, was it a drug that was being, I mean, is it a recreational use of this drug? I mean, it wasn't a matter of her taking this for some therapeutic purpose, presumably. Is it no, she, that's a very good point. And one that needs to be addressed is that she did not have a prescription for Dilaudid. She was a risk taker in all aspects of her life. I mean, she traveled Europe. She had gone on trips and things like that, and she had done things that many people would not have the nerve to do, experimenting with drugs was one thing that she was known to have done, and she and I had talked about that. Uh, I was working with her to try to curtail that, to get her to stop experimenting. Uh, but she was not an addict, and she was not a user of Dilaudid at all. So someone gave her Dilaudid. As simple as that. There's trafficking involved. Someone gave her Dilaudid. Have the police uh, talked about investigating this or perhaps looking into where these drugs came from? I sat down with the police officer following Brianne's death several times, both prior to the toxicology report coming in and after, but particularly after when it all came in, I sat down with him and I gave him a list of questions that I thought needed to be addressed. I wasn't accused of I'm a very supportive person of the police department. They have a very, very tough job, as does everybody involved in this particular situation. 
nonetheless, I wrote up this letter and I said, these are the questions I think should be addressed in your investigation. He thanked me very much, and then he went about trying to find the answers, or at least I think he did. Unfortunately, all I ended up getting in terms of results and answers was that he wasn't able to either reach the people or talk to them, and they refused to talk to him. And I'd give him names and places and phone numbers as to who he should be talking to, what the, uh, the scuttlebutt was about it, and I didn't get any satisfactory results from that in terms of interviews, uh, and I, no one would talk to me either. So basically, I was stonewalled, the police department was stonewalled, the people involved in that particular night have not been held accountable to at least even talk fully about it. Now, I shouldn't say all of them, perhaps some have, uh, so I don't want to suggest that no one has stepped forward and talked about it. The fact that remains that we still don't know what happened and who was involved and who will admit to it. You've talked to Amy Graves, I take it, about what happened with her brother yes. Josh, and, yes. I, and I know that you went down and you told your story down in Bridgewater. Is it Bridge, Bridgewater, wasn't it? It was um, Blockhouse, actually. Blockhouse, sorry, yes. Blockhouse. Close yeah. by. Oh, the, when you went down to Blockhouse, but you yeah. and you spoke with other people. What did you get from the stories that they told, and you know, in sharing yours in terms of the common experience? Well, the many common aspects. One of them, and I only spoke to a Amy Graves last Friday. It was by my in initiative. I called her and said, "Can we meet?" And I had not pursued this prior to because I was not emotionally equipped to it. Quite frankly, uh, the pain the pain is just so excruciating. You just don't want to invite it, and you can't think clearly. You can't speak clearly. But I. I did call her and I did meet with her on Friday and she said we have this meeting on Saturday at Blockhouse would you like to come and I did go and I talked and I listened to the others. One of the things that I think that comes out of this is the fact that we don't know enough. People are not well informed. I would say to parents out there, to families out there, that your children may be at risk and you may not even know it. I didn't know this. I didn't realize the extent of the potential consequences. I said to people after, had I known that this could have happened, I would have moved heaven and earth to prevent it from happening. And I think any mother, any father, any family member can relate to that. You would do anything to protect your child. So I'm not unique in that manner. So we need to shine a light on this. We need people to talk about it. We need people to come out, make it a focal point of discussion. I have not talked about it a great deal at all, but I'm prepared to do that now. Talk to anybody that wishes to talk about it. When I did look into it a little bit, I saw that there was a study done in the Annapolis Valley by a Dr. Richard Gould, and his report on the Annapolis Valley was very incisive and very clear that not only is there a problem with prescription drugs in the Annapolis Valley, but also throughout Nova Scotia, throughout Canada, throughout North America. So we in the metro area shouldn't suffer under the delusion that our children are not at risk. In a three-year period in Annapolis Valley, just three years that they were able to report accurately on that report, at least 11 young people died from prescription drugs. If you extrapolate the population comparing from the Annapolis Valley to HRM, while in that same three-year period, we may have had 30, 40, 50 youngsters have died from overdose of prescription drugs, and yet we don't hear about it. Why? Because people aren't talking about it. They're like me. Their child is gone. They cannot replace that child. No amount of talking will replace that child. They just keep it to themselves. Well, I think it's time that we shine a light on it and talk about it. Do you feel that you're compelled to do something for Brianne as a result of this? Uh, Brianne has been the motivating factor on everything, literally everything I've done since her death everything, where I work, what I do, on my off time, everything is, relates to my, my baby. She's my motivator. I try to make a difference in other people's lives because of my baby. And I, and I often ask myself, am I going to do something? What would Brianne think? What would she say? Would she agree? Well, if I asked her, should I go talk to Jordy Morgan about this? She would say, yes, you definitely should. That's why I'm here. You're still not entirely clear on the toxicology report, which I find astonishing. The toxicology report doesn't really draw any major conclusions. It says that she had a certain amount of drugs in her system, alcohol, Valium, Dilaudid, and the proportions, which mean nothing to me, that the coroner uh, ruled it to be an accidental death. That's all that I have, really. We've been through this war uh, with Amy, and it was the result of shoddy follow-up on behalf of the police. They apologized to her. In turn, you know, she had to go at them hammer and tong and deal with the media and everything else in order to try to get some progress in terms of an investigation into her brother's death. Do you feel like you're facing the same uphill battle that she's facing here? Well, yes, and it didn't become really clear to me until I found out uh, the results of what Amy had managed to achieve. 
through her persistence, her determination to get to the bottom of things, and the fact that she did open up another investigation, and the police actually, as you said, did end up apologizing for not doing the job right in the first place. And so it did bring back memories about what had happened during my discussion with the police officer involved, who was a very nice gentleman who was really compassionate when he dealt with me, and I hold no ill feeling to anybody in that regard. However, in one instance, for example, one of the girl who Brienne was celebrating with that night, he was un unable to locate her. I followed up, I did a follow-up call with him, and he said, well, I can't find her, and I don't know where she is. Well, I was puzzled by that. I hung up the phone, I got on the internet, and I found this young lady's uh, workplace, her address, the phone number, and I sent the officer an email saying, this is where you can find her. Acting on that, in the end, uh, my understanding is that he wasn't able to get any results. I guess what this comes down to, again, is how we approach this problem and how seriously we're taking this as a problem. Mm -hmm. There's evidence that it is becoming more of a problem. I'm not trying to overblow the issue because, you know... It, well, it one is, child is important. Well, it, Several it, dozen is, is not more important, but it's certainly worth considering no, looking well, at. I, I know. What, I, absolutely. <laughs> and that's, I guess, what I'm getting at. As I said, I don't think that we're being alarmist or saying that the problem is overblown. No. It's a serious, serious issue, and, yeah. and I think that people are deeply concerned about the way that we're looking at it in this province, that we're not taking it seriously enough. The provincial government doesn't seem to be taking it seriously enough. The police, yes, they're taxed. Yes, they have a tough job to do. But again, we, you know, we look at the Amy Graves case. Is this the way they're dealing with it? I know that there are police out there who are deeply concerned about it as well. What do you want to see happen? I mean, I guess... Well, Jordy, certainly what I think needs to be done is we need to shine a light on it, as I said earlier, and we need people who have been affected by this to step forward make their thoughts known talk to the people that can make a change everybody can make a change one person can make a change Amy Graves has proven that go to the website and, and get more information which is get prescription drugs off the streets.com as you know talk to the authorities I think that parents and it starts should start with parents and families they need to bring this to everyone's attention educators have to be involved Educators are interested in our kids. We are as well. I would talk to any group of high school students if I was invited. I very much felt that I would be, but I would certainly welcome the opportunity to talk to kids very frankly about the risks. I think the Justice Department has to take a long, strong, hard look at criminal liability in such situations where people are giving prescription drugs as recreational use. We need the health authorities, people to step forward to and do more, and I know they're doing many new, new things to try to get the prescription drugs out of the system. And finally, I think that in the HRM, we need to have a study the way they in, in the Valley. I'm a business person with a business background, and my, when, you, when you're faced with a problem, my initial reaction is, well, let's get the facts. The fact is we don't know the facts. We don't know how many young people have died from prescription drugs overdoses in HRM. Wouldn't you like to know? I would. If it's 30, if it's 40, if it's 50 in the last few years, I'd like to know. Uh, and I think we, des we deserve that. We, we owe it to ourselves to insist that a study be done in the HRM for this purpose. And I think we owe it to Brienne. John, thanks so much for coming in this morning. Thank you. And, uh, and just to acknowledge that Brienne is my stepfather. She has a father that her biological father cares about her just as much as I do and as well as other family members. And thank you so much, Jordan. Tom and Rob. Uh, 